certainly we're thankful to God Almighty for blessing all of us with the opportunity to worship him in spirit and in truth. We certainly are living in challenging times uh, with the coronavirus pandemic that is going on. Uh, many congregations are not having the opportunity to assemble uh, in person, and we just thank God for the technology that is available that we might live stream on things such as Facebook and Zoom. And shortly after this service is concluded, uh, it will be available on YouTube. Uh, just go to University Church of Christ, Cleveland, Ohio, and you will be able to see the entire service on YouTube. For those of you who were trying to call in for the conference call, uh, we have been having technological difficulties. We apologize for that. Uh, Brother Rick Winston, uh, one of the excellent brethren here, has been trying to get us connected. Uh, but if you're not able to get connected, again, if you have access to the Internet, you can look on YouTube following this service. Uh, give us about 30 minutes for it to be uploaded and you will be able to see it in its entirety. I want you to bow with me as we go to God in prayer. Gracious and eternal Father who art in heaven, holy and reverend is your name, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Father, we thank you at this time that you have provided the technology and the intelligence and the genius that has brought it about, and that we might still connect with one another though we are not able to be physically in one another's presence on this day. Father, our prayer is especially that you would be with Brother Greg Deutsch, the minister of the Wooster Avenue Church of Christ in Akron, Ohio. Uh, his wife was rushed to the hospital late last night, and we lift Sister Deutsch into your presence, asking you, O oh God, to be with those who are ministering to her medical needs, Bring to their memory what they've studied. Use them as instruments in your hand for her total healing and for your glory. Bless Brother Dorch and his entire family, as well as the Wooster Avenue Church of Christ. And we pray, O oh God, you would comfort, guide, and keep them. Father, we pray not only uh, for the University Church of Christ, but the people of God, the churches of Christ throughout this country, throughout this world, who are still endeavoring uh, to preach your word and to live out the truth of the gospel of Christ. Thank you for the opportunity I have now to share a thought from your word to those in our listening audience. My prayer, O oh God, is that you will get glory, uh, that Jesus will be lifted up, that saints of God will be strengthened and built up in the most holy and precious faith. And if there's someone who is watching or listening who has not yet obeyed the gospel of Christ, our prayer, O oh God, is that this message might touch their hearts. They might respond asking that wonderful question, men and brethren, what must I do to be saved? Thank you for Jesus the Christ who died on the cross for our sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And he's on your right hand making intercession even as we lift this prayer. It's in his blessed name we pray and ask it all. Amen. I'd like to share a thought with you from Matthew, but I want to thank uh, our three elders, Brother Greg Shields, Brother Frank Barnes, and Brother Donald Nelson, uh, for their being here to help us have a service for you. And, of course, Brother Rick Winston, uh, a brother that uh, we really love here at the University Church of Christ. He does so many things uh, without him, we wouldn't even be able to be on Facebook on today. But we thank God for, for these men, for these shepherds, for their support uh, in working out things so that you can have an opportunity to participate in a virtual worship assembly. I want you again to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through through 33. There the Bible reads thus. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. 
But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. I want to talk to us on this morning on the subject, Bridge Over, over Troubled Waters. I think we can all agree that at this time, not only in our country, but around the world, we are in the midst of troubled waters. The song, Bridge Over Troubled Waters, was originally composed by Paul Simon, performed as a solo by Art Garfunkel. It's a song about providing comforts for someone in need. Simon originally intended Bridge to be a simple two-verse gospel hymn, and one of the most moving renditions of this song is performed by the late Aretha Franklin on her gospel album, Amazing Grace. The lyrics to the song are, When you're weary, feeling small, When tears are in your eyes, I'll dry them all. I'm on your side, or when times get rough, And friends just can't be found like a bridge over troubled water. I will lay me down. Like a bridge over troubled water, I will lay me down. When you're down and out, when you're on the street, when evening falls so hard, I will comfort you. I'll take your part when darkness comes and pain is all around. Like a bridge over troubled water, I will lay me down. Like a bridge over troubled water, I will lay me down. The last verse says, sell on silver girls, sell on by. Your time has come to shine. All your dreams are on their way. See how they shine. Oh, if you need a friend, I'm selling right behind. Like a bridge over troubled water, I will ease your mind. Like a bridge over troubled water, I will ease your mind. In our message this morning, we will see how three miracles, Jesus walking on water and Peter walking on water, then storms and winds that cease, open our pathways to a bridge over the troubled waters of life, especially in a time like now. Jesus has just got done with one of his famous miracles, the feeding of the 5,000 from five loaves of bread and two fish in Matthew 14, verses 15 through 21. Jesus had business to tend to with his father, so he went up into the hills alone to pray. From supper to the fourth watch is about ten hours, and apparently Jesus had much to talk to his father about, for he spent ten to twelve hours in prayer. The scene where Jesus is away on a hill, and the disciples in the lowest part of the seas gives us a picture of how it is with Jesus today. We are in the lowest depths of this world, yet Jesus still intercedes for his followers even today from the heavenly hilltops above. In our Christian walk, as members of the Church of Christ, we go through different seasons. As Christians, there are seasons where we are experiencing the good times. There are blessings one after another. During these times, we sing the songs of Zion with joy, and then there are seasons where it feels like we're going through a drought and famine. This is when the tests and trials come. The enemy tries to steal our joy and our song. Where do we get the strength to handle all the pressures of life? How do we navigate through life's rocky pass in 
this fleshly tabernacle. We will experience tough times along the way. And, and right now, not only uh, those who are Christians, but those who are Christians are in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic and all of the orders that are coming down from the federal and the state as well as local government. So how do we handle these things? Before we get to Matthew 14 and after the Sermon on the Mount, the Bible records that there were other miracles that took place. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 2, a Jewish leper was killed with Christ present. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 5, there was the healing of the centurion servant from a distance. In Matthew chapter 8 verse 14 and 15, there was the healing of Peter's mother-in-law with Jesus there in the house. And then in Matthew chapter 8 and verse number 16, there was the healing all that were demon-possessed, the sick and the lame, with Jesus present. And then in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 through 27, we have another troubled water experience. The Bible says, beginning at verse number 23, And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Even the winds and the sea obey him. So when we come to Matthew 14, we see how three miracles, Jesus walking on water, Peter walking on water, and the storms of the wind cease, open our pathways to a bridge over the troubled waters of life. Amen. The disciples had been sent away by Christ. They willingly went into the sea through obedience. They didn't know they were headed into a storm, yet Jesus did. When we begin our journey of faith, quite often we don't see the storms that await us and lurking around the corners of life. But Jesus used this particular storm to manifest his grace in a miraculous threefold way. The storms that the disciples were in provided a canvas for Jesus to paint a portrait of love, mercy, and grace. What, what a beautiful image. It's a good thing that, that I didn't know all the storms I faced along my journey of faith. And I'm fairly sure that I would have chickened out in those early days of faith if I had a glimpse of the trials and the tribulations. And, and I ask a question, are you in a storm today? If so, I want to tell you to cheer up because Jesus wants to show you grace in a miraculous way. All too often we stop, we turn away, or we pause on our journey of faith when the storms come against us. The disciples never turned their boat from their appointed direction. They remained obedient in their journey, and then Jesus gives them a great blessing. Jesus was aware of their condition, and he demonstrated in a very real way just how much he cared. Listen. Jesus cares for you right now in whatever situation you may find yourself in on this morning. Let me talk about Jesus on the water. Because when the disciples were in the throes of the storm on the verge of perishing, Jesus arrives on the scene. I can well imagine that the first one to see Jesus didn't say anything because he didn't want to tell anyone else what he thought he saw. If you saw a UFO, how many folks would you tell? Enough of them laid their weary, dampened eyes upon this vision they thought was a ghost. And we hear their initial verbal response in verse 26. It's a ghost. The scriptures tell us that they cried out in fear. 
I think it would be safe to say they were screaming and raising a ruckus on that boat, and some probably thought about jumping ship as this ghost image came closer. Maybe Peter's wish to walk on the water came from this natural thought of flight and fear, except instead of swimming away. Peter wanted to walk to the master on the sea. Jesus knew their screams were fueled by fear, and he gives them a gentle reassuring command to don't be afraid and to be of good cheer. I'm not sure about you, but for me it would take some show enough convincing that what I saw wasn't a ghost. I can almost see the faces of those disciples in that troubled boat. Remember the storms had not ceased yet. They were still tossing the boat about like a leaf in the wind. And the fear of the storm and the fear of their vision were still fresh in their minds. And now Jesus tells them to be of good cheer and not to be afraid. Sounds hard to do, doesn't it? In the midst of the storms of life. We know that deep down in our hearts that God is in control. Amen. Amen. And even though we know that God is in control, yet we tremble sometimes in fear of the unknown. What will the next gust of wind bring? Will it overturn my life and turn me into a mess? At some point we must connect with what we know is true with the reassuring voice of the Master because he is still the one today that calms the storms of our lives. How can we connect with the Master's voice this morning when he is on the hilltop in heaven sitting at the right hand of God? When the storms of life, when this coronavirus pandemic or COVID-19 as it's also called, appears to be knocking us down, we, we must remember that even when it seems hopeless, we can and we must go to the Master in prayer. It is only through this avenue of communications that we can find Him. In the book of Psalms, chapter 121, verse 1 and 2, the psalmist said, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. I want to remind us today that our help still comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. But that was Jesus walking on the water. What about Peter on the troubled waters? We come now to the second miracle of that day. Peter, seeing his master, calls out to him with a two-letter word of doubt. Lord, if it is you. Peter uses the word if. Apparently, Peter was not truly convinced that it was indeed Jesus. When we see light at the end of our dark tunnels, we also call into question the source of the deliverer. When we don't acknowledge the master that healed us or delivered us from that temptation, we in essence are saying the same two-letter word of doubt, if. Peter's request is built around doubt. And yet Jesus shows him favor. Peter is the only disciple that calls out to the master. Were the others so afraid that they couldn't even speak? Peter asked Jesus to allow him to come to him on the water. Notice that Peter didn't say how he should come to Jesus on the water, only to come to him. And what you and I need to do as we look at the storms of our lives, that just as Jesus came walking on their storm, he still comes walking on the storms of our lives, whether it is cancer, whether it is coronavirus uh, that comes in, pandemic, or it's some other illness, chronic disease, or, or addiction, or there is some, some funds that we don't have in order to meet all of our debts. There's trouble in our homes. Whatever the problem is, Jesus still comes walking on our storm. God, I, I need this and that and this other thing. And we ought to call out to him to bring us closer to him in a way that he chooses. 
Let us draw close to the master that knows what is best for us. Let him be the one that controls the elements that are prevailing against us. If we allow God to move in this way and in his way, we just may be amazed at how the master works. Sometimes we limit God with our own natural human boundaries. What we cannot do, God can. The impatience of Peter is consistent as we will see when Peter jumps boat after the resurrection of Christ. But notice Peter did not say, if it is you, I'll come to you. Instead, Peter said, if it's you, bid me to come. There's a big difference in the two. You see, we must wait upon the Lord before we move in the storms of life. Very often there's a tendency to jump ship and we wind up drowning because we didn't ask God for his will. We impatiently jump overboard and wind up in a big mess. If you are in a storm today, please seek God's counsel through prayer through the reading of his word and surrounding yourself with Christian brothers and sisters who will give you spiritual guidance and destruction. Any other way could lead you to perish. It is very important to note that Peter didn't try to walk on water. My Bible says he walked on water. Jesus approved of Peter's affection to draw closer to him any way possible and allowed him to overcome the natural laws of the world to accomplish this mission. Those in the boat must be going through an emotional roller coaster about now. First, they are told to depart from their master, and then they find severe winds that bring them to the point of death. Next, they think they see a ghost and discover it's Jesus walking on water, and now of all things, they see Peter walking on water. When we seek God's counsel and ask in faith, he will provide the way. There are some in this world that when God provides the way, they fight against it, kicking and struggling all the way. When we see God's way of deliverance, And if it doesn't meet our expectations, we commence to kick and scream. Very, very often there are those who are invited to to obey the gospel of Christ. They are told about the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day according to the scriptures. They are, are told to believe the truth of the gospel because without faith it's impossible to please God for he that comes to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. They are told to repent of their sins, change their mind, change their will and change their actions, turn from the ways of the world and turn to God. They are told to confess with the mouth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then complete their obedience in baptism for the remission of sins. And rather than doing those things, they balk at it because they believe they have a better way. When we see God's way of deliverance, If it doesn't meet our expectations, somehow we have the hurt and the pain and we struggle with fear and turmoil and know that the way of our deliverance is through Jesus. And yet they don't come. They resist out of fear and frustration that they have to get out of their boat even though it is sinking and come to Jesus. I've met many people that leave services early or even quit coming to the worship assembly when they know there will be an invitation to a commitment to the master. They continue to live their stagnant lives, kicking and screaming, resisting the only way to a safe and comfortable pathway to peace and safety. How sad. In the text, we see that Peter is walking towards his Savior. And all is fine except one thing. Peter takes his eyes off Jesus and notices the weather. 
The wind is still howling like crazy, but the fact that Jesus had calmed the winds earlier was not on his mind. While Peter's faith was keeping his head above water, the world of doubt was beginning to cause him to sink. What was Peter thinking? What could have possibly distracted him from this most famous feat of feet? He was defying gravity and walking on water, and now he was sinking. We often find ourselves distracted by the world. When focusing on Jesus, Satan will do all he can to throw obstacles in our pathways. It is these distractions that cause us to lose focus if we allow them to overtake our concentration. When in worship, we often look around at those sitting around us. At first, it's only one thought, but then another, and then the other person pops into our minds. Next thing you know, we are sinking in our worship of Christ. Many times we find ourselves sinking in life and can't seem to even hear much less see our Savior because the outside winds of the world have caused us to completely lose focus on the one that can deliver us. We must consider Jesus' offer to extend marvelous grace to all that call upon his name. It is grace like rain that falls upon any that draw close to the master. And if we take our eyes off the world, we will find marvelous grace that brings joy unspeakable and full of glory. Matthew 6.33, Jesus tells us the remedy. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added under you. Peter has a sure enough dilemma on his hands now. Peter must have been thinking, my big fat mouth got me where I am now. If I'd only kept quiet and remained patient, I wouldn't be out here about to drown. Peter had to do something and do it quick. He prayed one of the shortest prayers ever mentioned in the Bible. Lord, save me. The bridge over troubled water. Jesus could have let Peter sweat it out a little by giving him a lecture before he saved him, but he didn't. The scriptures tell us at Peter's most desperate point of need, Christ reached his hand out to Peter. And to all of you who are listening this morning, this is exactly where Jesus is today. He is reaching out for all that are in desperate need of a Savior. Jesus doesn't scold us for being so stupid or ignorant. He simply extends his nail-scarred hand of love and says, I'll save you because I love you. Just obey my voice. The next words of Christ to Peter provide so much insight on the condition of Peter's heart. I believe that Jesus granted Peter his wish to prove a point. Peter was of the opinion that his faith could take him anywhere and do anything. Peter thought of himself as a super-Christian, and Jesus allows him to prove to himself and the rest of the world just how weak his faith really was. Jesus knew what Peter was going to do, and so he uses this situation to give you and I a glimpse of what puffed-up faith looks like. As Peter was being pulled from the depths of the sea, Jesus rebuked him for his lack of faith. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Jesus was telling Peter that his faith was small. And if he hadn't doubted, he could have completed his journey without embarrassment. How many Christians this morning have begun a great journey only to find themselves sunk in failure because of their distracted faith? The numbers are staggering. The destruction is great and many lives lie in ruin. Jesus didn't leave Peter there to drown. And he doesn't want anyone here today to lie in ruins. Jesus is a savior of new beginnings. You can start a new life today if you're only willing to step out of the sinking boat and and come to Jesus. Stop wallowing in self-pity and shame and embarrassment and come to the one that gives peace, joy, and love. 
That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The last miracle in this text is in verse 32. Jesus hauls Peter into the boat and immediately the wind stops. That's like putting an exclamation at the end of a sentence. In essence, Jesus was telling Peter, do you see what I mean? If you only trust me, I can take away everything that separates you from me. At this point, all the other disciples remarked that, wow, this is truly the Son of God. Have they all forgotten about the five loaves and two fish that fed the 5,000 already? What else was it going to take to prove that Jesus is who he says he is? There are those today that aren't completely sold out on Jesus, claim to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. They aren't ready to trust him because everything isn't neatly laid out in order for them to make sense of it all. They want everything to make complete sense and have no questions before they're ready to commit themselves. Let me ask you a question. What do you think you could do for the kingdom if your faith wasn't distracted? Could you walk on water? Could you do even greater things if only we can only find a way to push away the distractions that are desperately trying to sink us? If we could only draw closer to Christ so that we can remain in union with Him and His love, leaving all our cares behind us as we get drawn into His marvelous grace, guess what? We can. We can right here and right now. This world has never seen what God can do with a person that has completely given a committed heart to Christ. I, for one, would like to find out what a group of folks would do if they commit themselves to the cause of Christ in a sick and dying world, a world where there isn't much hope. Can you imagine how this community could be shaken for the kingdom if those of us who are members of the body of Christ, and especially at university, would come together in an agreement that focuses our hearts and our minds completely on Christ and nothing else? I say to the members of the University Church of Christ and to all Christians everywhere, let Jesus be your bridge over troubled waters. Regarding his power, there is no lack nor limit. Regarding his power, there is no fault nor fatigue. Regarding his power, there is no pretense nor paralysis. Regarding Jesus' power, there is no strain nor stress. Regarding his power, there is no wanting nor weakness. It is this power that makes corrupt men good. It is this power that makes drunken men sober. It is this power that makes deceitful men honest. It is this power that makes selfish men considerate. It is his power that makes godless men righteous. And it is his power that makes weak men strong. There's never been a battle that the Lord could not win. There's never been a burden that the Lord could not lift. There has never been a disease that the Lord could not heal. There has never been a heartache that the Lord could not feel. A loneliness that the Lord could not comfort. There has never been a promise that the Lord could not keep. There has never been a darkness that the Lord could not dispel. For all of you who are listening in, who may not be Christians yet, and who are still searching for the truth, Jesus is the answer. He is the bridge over troubled waters. Paul said in Romans 1, 14, I am debtor both to the Greek and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the good news that Jesus came to this earth, paid a debt that he didn't owe for a crime that he didn't commit. He died for your sins and my sins. He was buried and he got up on the third day and said, now I've got all power in heaven and in earth. He's gone back 
And he's on the right hand of God in heaven, making intercession for the saints of God. He's the head of the church that he promised to build in Matthew 16, 18. Paul said in Ephesians 1, that God has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. In Acts chapter 2, verse 47, the Bible says they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Even though we're not congregated or aggregated in a building somewhere right now together, uh, but you can always call us at the University Church of Christ. Look at our website. You can get the telephone number there. And you can also contact us via email if you want to know more about the gospel of Christ. We can help you even during this pandemic to obey the gospel. Praise be to God. Brother Adriel Wilson, the minister there at the Northfield Church of Christ in Akron, Ohio, baptized the precious soul in the body of Christ just on last night. We can still help people obey the gospel, though we are not having our regular assembly times. And for those who are Christians and who are in need of prayer, you can always call the church office. I apologize that we weren't able to get those on the conference call because I was going to conclude this message and then go to the conference call and take your prayer request. But you can always call us, and we'll be glad to pray with you for your specific needs. And I want you to remember that God loves you. Jesus died for you. I love you, and I am your servant. I thank God once again for the opportunity to proclaim his word. It's always my desire that he gets the glory, that Jesus Christ is exalted. Saints of God are strengthened, edified, built up in the most holy and precious faith. And those of you who are still searching for the way, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. May God bless you, and may he keep you in his loving care.